Welcome to the Cultivating Success Podcast. Jeff Sofer and Jonathan Wolfson are brothers and business partners of the top landscaping company, Nature's Experts. Nature's Experts is home to six companies that cater to all your outdoor needs. To learn more about Jeff and Jonathan, simply visit us at www.naturesexperts.com. On the podcast, Jeff and Jonathan bring together other business owners and entrepreneurs to share with you how they developed a prosperous company and how you can too. You will gain insights and meaningful advice on creating the building blocks to success and longevity in the entrepreneurial realm. And now, here are your hosts, Jeff Sofer and Jonathan Wolfson. David, good morning. Welcome to the Cultivating Success Podcast. We're happy to have you here and to have you shed a light on the business consulting field. Good morning, so, David. Hey, Hello. thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. We are really excited to have you here today. We have purchased a lot of businesses in our uh, time working together. And, you know, we are always looking to connect with more people that are like-minded that really can shed new light and really help give us expertise, which I know gives our listeners expertise that they can use and apply on a day-to-day -day basis. And by giving them resources of who they can actually directly speak to, see and actually get help, real help from people who know exactly what to do like you, David. And find solutions, solutions awesome. to problems. So David, I think the first thing we should do to, for our listeners is why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the consulting business? Yeah, sure. So, you know, uh, like every story, it started in childhood where I was trying to hustle cash whenever I could. And I would always try to figure out ways to, to make money, especially when I was too young to get a job. And I did all those childhood things, you know, delivering newspapers, mowing lawns, yep. grew up in Canada. So, you know, like clearing snow was a big part of, you know, the childhood income earning uh, matrix. And um, eventually my interest in business led me to business school because I thought they were going to turn me into a businessman. About third year there, I realized that what they were trying to do is turn me into what I now call a Fortune 500 bureaucrat, you know, some kind of mm -hmm. middle manager in a big organization when you're sitting around debating case studies about whether you know GM should enter a new foreign market and you realize, wow, none of the business people in this town are ever going to face these questions. And that was my area of interest. I, I would drive around seeing these businesses right in the community and, and I'd be interested in those businesses. And so my real valuable information uh, education for small businesses came when I graduated. I got a job as a sales rep for the Yellow Pages. You're really and lucky. I, I'm, I'm thinking about that right now too, because I uh, did go to college. I did not graduate college. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's interesting that at such a young age, you actually kind of drew that conclusion because that's kind of a pretty big um, thing to really start to understand at a young age like that. You know, you're 21, 22 years old when you graduated and you think to yourself, listen, this is the path of if I'm the 0.00001%. This actually doesn't help me or anybody else. And I want to be able to help people. So what really drew you to that conclusion? Well, wait a minute, but did you have someone who like pointed that out to you or you just completely discovered this interest on your own? No, it, it was, it was on my own. And it, it's interesting too, because in my family growing up, here's my, you know, sob story. I didn't, I never lived in a dumpster or anything like that at any point in my history. I grew up in one of those households where mom stayed home and made lunch for me every day when I was going to school. It was a really great household. And dad was an engineer who worked for a, a department in the government. So there was like no entrepreneurial um, nurturing right. at all in right. home, at the home. It was something that completely bubbled up from inside of me. And it was an interest that I had. And I drew inspiration for, remember that old TV show, Family Ties with yes. uh, Mike, Alex, uh, P. Alex, <laughs> Alex P. P. Keaton. Yeah. yeah. I remember the scene where he would drop, someone would drop change on a table and he would be able to add up the coins by the noises they made. Right. And so like, to me, that was an inspirational character. And yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm going to make money one day and I'm going to be in business. And, you know, I was already at that time in my early twenties, um, realizing when I heard the stories of these big executives and these big companies, and I realized these guys are working 70, 80 hours a week, they're flying all around, seems glamorous, but I was already starting to realize that sounds like a lot of work for something you don't really own. And even today, when I hear younger people talk about their careers, like it's something they own, I'm like, you're talking about your job, 
Yep. Like you don't own that. Yep, right. Some policy could change in the company. You could all be you gone. You own your but... skills. You own your skills and That's your it. ability. That's why you have to cultivate your skills and ability constantly retooling and refining and, you know, continuing to make them better well, by partnering. You didn't finish. That's why you got to cultivate your success. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Cultivate your success. Thought, there you huh? go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so when I worked for the yellow pages, That's I would call on guys like you. Yeah. Right. So I would go around. I was called. I, would, I was called on by guys like you. Yeah, and I back, that would back a hundred yeah. years ago. Do you know what a double yeah. truck is? Yeah, he was one of the customers of a double <laughs> truck. <laughs> maybe they didn't have. Was those that in an Canada. ad size? No, maybe they just didn't. Because it's funny. Maybe you didn't have those in Canada. Maybe that's not a Canada term. A. Eh? <laughs> when I was there, we had many in different Canada, dimensions. They say that, a, if you're typically a Canadian, uh, yeah, yeah. humor, yeah, and yeah, so, exactly. I would ask people, you know, next time the phone rings, who do you want on the other end of the line? What kind of customer are you looking for? Oh, and so oh. I would learn their business model of a lot of these businesses, who they were looking for and how they made money. And I developed that mile wide, inch deep kind of expertise across the span of small, medium sized businesses. Mm -hmm. But that was really a formative time for me. Um, but you know, Google Which was I coming think around something this people need to actually understand too, that that is a, if you wouldn't have gone through the situation where you actually got a high volume of calls, interested parties describe to them how your tools, services, so on and forth could help them. You wouldn't have realized all the help that there is that that could be needed to all these different types of businesses. It seems like literally working for the yellow pages and selling paper ads mm -hmm has really translated into your long-term vision that you really wanted to be able to help more people in a real professional way, not teaching theories. You want to teach real business. It seems like, was that literally like the spark almost? Well, I'll tell you what the, what the encouragement was to stay in it for as long as I did is when I would work with somebody and show them try to demonstrate the value of investing a little more money into a bigger ad and then coming back the next year and having them tell me how the volume of the phone calls increased and how their business grew and then encouraging them to get into an even bigger ad and just watching as their business grew, as the volume of inquiries got bigger and bigger, that was the biggest encouragement. And I also observed it in the opposite direction where we had a bit of an economic downturn at one point. Some people look to cut their advertising yes. spending and, and be doing more actually and their calls went down and then next year they want to cut again and yeah. i remember this one plumber when i first met him he had seven service vans that were on the road and by the time i stopped getting the account we didn't always necessarily get the same ones every year uh, by the time i stopped getting his account he was down to three and wow, always yeah. complaining about how hard it was in business but always cutting the thing that would help bring more calls you know most people back in the day, even now, but back in the day, a lot of people just, they didn't understand the basics of that. If there is a downturn, you actually have to advertise more. It's an easy thing to cut and was different in those days is that you had to make that decision once a year and then you committed to a uh, year because the book would come yeah. out. Nowadays with online advertising, you can alter it all the Change time as much you as want. you want. You know, a double yeah. truck was two full pages together. That's what, a double, uh, that's what they call the double truck here. And so, yeah, you can imagine there were beautiful flowers on the whole one side. Yeah. A, yeah. And by the way, and it was color. <clears throat> so a double truck in color. I mean, that's like, it was like the ultimate, you know, the we, we used to call that a DPP double page process and oh, process okay. so referring to the color. That was the Canadian double truck. Yeah. That's yeah. so funny. It really was an unbelievable business. Your, the business that you were selling was really unbelievable because it was gold to have certain pages. If you had the first page of that ad, you know, uh, chapter or so, so to speak, you know, in there, or if you had this double truck or if you had a specific type of ad and it was really, really something. And I remember being a, someone who was an advertiser and it really being like so excited about, you know, where's my ad going to land. And then when the books were delivered, you know, you're like, Oh, let me see my ad. And now you think of it, it's like, gosh, it's so back in the olden days, you know, it's just like a crazy thing. One of my favorite tricks for new advertisers that were just starting out, if they were really budget conscious was to put in a smaller ad, like a 16th or an eighth of a page, just to have black ink on the yellow background 
but to pay a little bit extra for one color, just red or blue, right, and right. put a thin like hand circle around the phone number so that it looked like someone else had been in the book before and circled the number. Oh, that's very smart. smart. Right? We, never got and, that, we never got that advice. Oh, we? no. And well, they people, get better advice in Canada. <laughs> people really appreciated that. And it was, a, it was a trick I kept from my colleagues because if everyone did it, it wouldn't work. Right. Oh, wow. I'm going to use that on my business card. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. It's amazing to see uh, the decline and the really the ruin of a business. Uh, I'm talking about the yellow pages you know, through the years, how it was like the king and it became mm. mud. And it was like, you know, the book, and the book was so thick, you could almost barely lift it. And now, you know, the book is like the, like a little magazine. It's so thin. They give yeah, me it's a literally poster. a metaphor of just attrition with businesses. Yeah. If you don't conform to your customer, change, if you don't find right. new ways yep. of doing things or whatever, yeah. you eventually will literally erode away to absolutely nothing. I get a postcard these days with a phone number that says, if you'd like to receive the yellow pages, call this number, we'll drop it off. <laughs> and now, wow. so what I've heard though, is that for certain industries, there's still value there. Um, what they taught us at yellow pages is that purchasing habits are created at points in your life. So when you come of age and you need your own home, or if you have a child for the first time, you need to go looking for things for the child. That's when you create these purchase habits and there are still people out there today that have the habit of hunting for things in the yellow pages. I know someone who has a maid service business and they put the biggest ad in the book, which is now very small, right? Because there's not many people advertising in there, but they consistently get a flow of senior citizens who are calling them from that ad. I bet. So there's still some value depending on what yeah. you're trying to sell. Yeah. Interesting. So David, please tell us. So there's a very interesting uh, takes on a lot of things that it's really, you know, your experiences have one side and our, we have yeah, another opposite back down memory lane side yeah, of the experience yeah. or whatever. So please continue to tell us how you really have developed your consulting business, yeah. how, how you've really gotten to where you are now. So when I was in the yellow pages, Google came out. And initially, if you typed plumber into Google, no matter where in the world you were, you'd get a plumber in California, right? Because they yeah, hadn't figured right. out local searching. But as the years went by, they got better and better and better at that. And so I realized that the future was dim for Yellow Pages. And I thought, yeah. I, I need to do something else. So uh, I started investing. I bought a few apartment buildings and things like that. And I thought, I can afford to step out and do a business of my own because I've built up some of this passive income on the side. So um, you know that company 1-800-GOT-JUNK, that junk removal yeah, business? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I tried to buy one of those franchises and they told me my market was too small. So I read the E-Myth by Michael Gerber and I just copied their business model. I just copied as much as I could understand from the outside, got a truck and got underway for like 10 grand with a partner. And within six months, we had three employees and we weren't driving in the truck anymore ourselves. And we, we built that up, but my heart wasn't in it. I was, I'll tell you, dealing with business people is very different than dealing with homeowners as I'm sure you guys know, or and yeah. I knew I did not want to deal with homeowners. So we sold that business. That was the first business I ever had a hand in selling. And I decided to get into finance brokerage. So uh, I took a training, like a two day training seminar of how to be a broker of, of financing for businesses. And I opened up a shop and I started to serve people that couldn't get bank financing for their business, started to do capital leases, factoring facilities, things like that. And then um, something happened, the uh, financial crisis on Wall Street. Remember asset-backed commercial paper? Well, yes. a lot of the companies that I was getting money from to help the small businesses, ah, they you. were creating asset-backed commercial paper. That was their source of money. Mm -hmm. And so when the market seized up and nobody wanted to buy that stuff, those guys went out of business. My deal flow seized up and I was like, oh, what am I going to do now? But in that time, when I was brokering small business debt, I kept meeting people who were trying to buy businesses and they were looking for money to buy the business. And I worked with a few of them. And what I learned very quickly is that a lot of them were involved in deals that were just nightmares, but they didn't know it. They were dealing with intermediaries who had no idea what they're doing. People like real estate agents, even some attorneys and accountants 
who understood some aspect of buying a business, but not the whole thing. We would have uh, people put down deposits and it would be like a real estate contract with no due diligence period. Like it was a firm contract with a, with a deposit given, but there would be no consideration for operating capital, for example, in the contract, like all kinds of missing things. And I saw some people get into some bad deals and so I you saw, saw people... an opportunity like you've had a plan yeah. seeing already in your life. And well, I, kind of I knew that. that I knew better, but I knew yeah. that I was still ignorant. Yeah. I didn't know. I also knew that he wanted to do business to business and not business to consumer. That's right. And the thing yeah. is that there's two really big markets. One is not better than the other, but you do need to pick. And it's difficult. A lot of times, most people can't straddle the line of being able to service both because they communicate in two different ways mm. and you really have to wear two different types of hats. Well, and you did yeah, business to consumer, you did business to consumer with the yellow pages. You did business to consumer with your factoring and all the other stuff that you did. Business um, to business. Business to business. And now yeah. you want to do business. Yeah, that's really good. Interesting. Yeah. It's interesting because like John said, you had to like pick so that you had to identify what you know lane you wanted to choose. Yeah. So I decided since things were drying up with finance brokerage, I decided to become a business broker at the cusp of a, the Great Recession. And I joined up with a big international franchise brand in the business brokerage world because of yes. the access to training. What's the name of it? Sunbelt. Sunbelt. Okay. We yeah. know Transworld very well. Transworld is a big one too. And there is another one as well. But at the time, Sunbelt had about 300 offices around the world, 30 okay. in Canada. Okay. And so I joined up as a broker in someone else's office went through the training that was provided by the IBBA. So there's a, a professional designation program that they offer. And I went through that, took about two and a half years while I was working under the wing of a more experienced person. And so I learned what I needed to know to, to start doing this. And eventually I bought my local office that I was working in. And I ran that for about three years and did 35 deals. So that sounds like a nice, even steady business. And if you looked at the annual financial statements of that business, what you would have seen is a 40 to 50% year over year growth every year in revenue and earnings. And you would have thought, wow, that's David's very successful, but it was a nightmare because in that business, you get paid when a deal is closed. Right. And so in each of those three years, there were periods of time from seven to nine months long with no closings. Right. And my monthly nut was like the overhead of the business and personal was close to 10 grand a month. It was like a nightmare to live during that time when yeah. you didn't get paid. Yeah. All the gray hair on the side of my head comes yeah. from that period of my life. Yeah. 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 Uh, I remember taking cash advances on personal credit cards to be able to pay my receptionist on payday. Wow. And to live through that kind of stressful time gives a, a very good appreciation for what it's like to be an entrepreneur in small business, because I sometimes will throw out these funny questions to people, and then I'll immediately know if they've been through certain kinds of stress in their business or not, yeah. because I've lived it and I know what it was like. And so the reality of that industry is that the commission rates seem high if you compare it to real estate, for example, but and everyone gets into it because they say, wow, if I sell a million dollar business, I'm going to get a you know, $100,000 paycheck or something. But the reality is you can spend years working on a file. And then when the deal finally closes, there's all kinds of things that can happen to unclose it. There was one of the first listings I got was a fried chicken franchise and the guy owned the real estate and he was insistent he would not separate the two. He would not sell the business and become the landlord. So not only did I have to find a buyer for the business, but a buyer for the building in the same person at the same time. And over a three-year period, I sold it three times. Mm. The first two times didn't close. Mm. So I worked on that file for three years. At the end of the day, I sold it. And he wrote me a high five-figure commission check. And he said, wow, look at you. Look at all the money you've earned. And his name was Tony. And I said, Tony, the person that works for you at the front counter has earned more money. Yeah since I've met you yeah. than I just did. Just so you know, Tony, you're a dick for even <laughs> writing me that because you just shows how ignorant and stupid you are and what a jerk you are after you don't even see if he's, 
he's a person that works, maybe not an entrepreneur because he owned a franchise. I don't know what his mindset was. But there's a lot of people like that. You know, they begrudge you for having done the work that you did and of course don't see the value in it. Well, you just can't count people's money. It's what it's the real terrible. value is. And there's value in time spent, which you put an inordinate amount of time to close one transaction. Terrible. But then there's also the value of some transactions close really, really quick. Yeah. But guess what? It's because of you. Right. There are some times when it's not because of you and it's just the market, but that really doesn't happen that often. You know what I mean? Like what we just went through with the housing market is an anomaly. That doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen again, probably. I mean, how like, there were 20 people lining up at an open house to make offers. You're talking about, I that. mean, maybe it'll yeah. happen again for a blip of a period, yeah. but it's not going to ever be the norm that there'll be a line of people waiting to purchase right. houses and pay over a market ask or whatever. So that is a time that you enjoy, but you don't get to keep forever. Besides that, it's your know how, it's your connections, and it's your determination that you're going to be able to make sure you close the deals that you can close in a reasonable amount of time or ones that take three years like you had experience. It is typical of most people though to mm -hmm. not have the, any value in what you've done or give you the kind of credit that you so deserve for what you did for them. And then they begrudge mm -hmm. you, which you definitely don't need, but you do need people to not begrudge you for making the money that you're making and it being justified. It's just absolutely ridiculous and it happens all the time. It's true. It's true. That was, you know, that deal finally closed in December of 2011. I got into brokerage at the end of 2008. So, th so that deal bracketed my oh. career as an office owner. And that fall, I'll, I'll tell you what eventually drove me out the door. I had six deals lined up to close that fall. And one deal fell apart because it was a regulated industry and the government agency wouldn't issue a license to the buyer. A second deal fell, and those six deals were supposed to bring in a quarter million dollars of commission. The second deal fell apart because a bank that issued a financing letter later rescinded it, saying, we like the deal, but we've been told by head office we're overexposed to this industry sector, mm. so we don't want to do any loans. So just like the deal fell apart. Mm. The third mm. deal was a franchise. Uh, the third one that fell apart was a franchise, and the buyer and seller got along really well. But then the buyer had to qualify with the franchisor. And the people he met from their head office just treated him terribly. They were total jerks to him. And the buyer said, you know what? I, I love this business. I'd like to buy your business, Mr. Seller, but I will not get into business with those people. Yeah. And so he backed out of that deal. And so the last three deals, including Tony's, um, Tony's chicken place, they, they brought in like 110 grand instead of the quarter million. But it was enough money for me to clear off my credit cards and lines of credit. And I right. just said, this is it. This is the ripcord moment. Not wasting any more of my life doing this. Yeah. I, and I had two young kids at the time. That was a year I learned I was getting a divorce. And I just thought, I need, I need something that is more stable, something that uh, can allow me to plan. <laughs> you got plan. two divorces. You got two divorces that year. I, that's the year. And divorce from your wife. So January 2012, I started working for a bank. And I'll tell you the first two times they got, they paid me, right? Every second week I got paid. I felt so guilty receiving that money because <laughs> I thought, what on earth, what dragon did I slay to deserve that? Wow. Because I was so used to, used to mountains yeah. Yeah. to get to payday. That it almost became that that was the norm and what you were doing now was not the norm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, you said you uh, sort of interview people and you ask lots of poignant questions. I'm using the word poignant. You ask lots of poignant questions to people to sort of like get an idea of different things. I do the exact same thing. When I'm speaking to someone or interviewing someone for something, you know, you want to get a sense of them in a certain way because what's the point of continuing on in the conversation if you know that they're not right for something? So I, I do the exact same thing. And I think that's very smart to do. So I guess with the business that you have now and the business that you're in now, do you still ask those types of questions to people to get a sense of, you know, if they want to hire you to consult on looking over documents for a business they're going to buy or a P&L or something, do you still ask them questions first to make sure this, they really know what they're getting into or do you wait until they hire you to ask those questions? It really depends. Um, you know, if somebody comes to me with and they're clearly a newbie, an amateur that's yeah. that's never really been in the world of business before. Yeah. I'll work on 
analyzing the deal and and when I'm doing the presentation of what I've discovered, I'll be probing and asking and, and saying like, you know, in this industry, you're going to be having a high turnover of lower paid staff, for example, maybe what you guys face with your lawn maintenance a little bit. And I'll start asking them certain questions like, are you going to be comfortable, you know, firing someone because you caught them using drugs on the job and you know that they're going to be kicked out of their apartment because they don't get the paycheck from you? Like, I'll ask them certain questions like that because I'll try to shine a light on what the reality of their upcoming future may be like. Right. And what kind of decisions, is. yeah, that they're going to have to face. Yeah. Because a lot of the times, like that fried chicken place I mentioned, I'd have people that were like bankers, government bureaucrats coming in to look at the business because it was a really good business at a really good cash flow. And these people would come in and they'd be asking all kinds of questions about financial stuff. And the first time they would meet Tony, we would usually have a meeting at my, my boardroom because his business was open for long hours every day. And they'd ask money, questions about money. And I would say, first of all, let's have Tony describe his average day. And he would, he would talk about how he would get in in the morning. And the first thing he'd have to do is recount the till because it would never balance from the night before. And then he'd have to like uh, take, make sure the staff was doing the cleaning regimen. They had a four-day cleaning cycle in the kitchen. But he would be the only one that would clean the French fry slicing machine because he didn't want to risk a workplace health and safety claim, right? And then he would show where he'd been cut on his hands by the machine. And then he would talk about the deep fryers and show where he got burned one time oh. by the deep fryer, right? And so all of a sudden, he's injecting the reality of what it's like to be the owner of this business. And the reason it performs so well is because he's present in the business, right? right? And when he goes home at four o'clock, it's his son-in-law that came in. And that guy managed it in the evening, right? So they, they had this management method, which is typical of small businesses owned by family, which was have a family member there. Yeah. Right. And so he would then explain how by 11 AM, he would realize which employees just weren't showing up. And then he'd get on the phone and try to call them. Then he'd try to bribe employees who had the day off to come in. He'd call them and say, Hey, if you come in, I'll put an extra hour on your check or whatever. And if he couldn't get them in, it meant that he would be working on the front line, taking orders. The whole day, the right? and- whole entire day. Yeah. And so these people who just saw the six figure cash flow, they didn't see the work that went into getting it. Right. And what the reality of his day was like. And when people would say, well, what if I just hired a manager like, you know, all the other fast food places you see, he would say, well, you could do that, but you'd probably have a 30% decline in performance. Like he knew, he knew. You know, speaking, you know, being someone who has integrity, and honesty and wants to do the right thing. There's plenty of buyers out there. There's plenty of sellers out there. Why would anyone ever want to try to put somebody into the wrong type of marriage? And we specifically- make money. Some people, they just want to make a paycheck. There's more, if you're selling a business that actually does make money, there's way more people out there that are interested in buying that business. Why would you want to set it up for a failure to put somebody who's not prepared to put in those kinds of things like he is? So we, uh, Jeff and I, at one time actually owned a restaurant, actually. Uh, It was right next door to one of our businesses, and Jeff owned the property. And, uh, you know, we explained to them, this is our core business, you know, what we're currently in right now. The restaurant isn't. It would be more of an ancillary business. And like describing all of these reasons why it's turnkey, it's great. There's It was a franchise also, we should mention. It was a franchise. Mm -hmm. That's why they're saying it was turnkey, yeah. There's this other owner, he doesn't even come in, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing is, is that it is almost obvious, but it's not obvious. You know what I mean? So it's always easy to look at the numbers and be like, Ooh, wow, that's super sexy. Or wow, where we're saving this money and they're going to give us this and then look what we get. And the thing is, is that if you're really in business to make a lot of money and to do really well, you need to give the right advice all the time. And for us, we really got a little bit of a bait and switch and it cost us a lot of money because it was never our core business. So since it wasn't our core business, a small business like most of these franchises require extreme supervision until you get the level of business up to a certain amount of money. So if someone would have said to us, listen, the business can be turnkey. You can work at it from home, but it does not, however... You can't ever get there unless your sales go from here to here. 
Because when you get to this point, you can afford to do this, that, and the other, whatever. You know what I say? Basically what you're describing, <laughs> buyer beware. Because it's literally buyer beware. Because someone like you who has integrity and who has character and you are asking questions and you know wanting to make sure that people are getting the right buyer, buys the right business. There are so many business brokers and others that play parts in, in these sales and transactions. And we have seen them and not just that time with uh, the franchise as well, that you do have to be very aware. And most people that I would say are very green with understanding how to buy businesses, they can be taken in a heartbeat. And literally, if you didn't ask those questions and just make them aware of just that, what you said about just Tony with showing his hand, you know, that had scrapes and then burns, and then being that he would be constantly dealing with these hurdles every single day with the employees or this or that. If they didn't know that information, everything looks like they would buy. And a lot of business brokers, I'm telling you, because I've seen some of them, they would leave a lot of that information out. So the only reason that you did that is because it was important to you. That's the only reason I can imagine, because that could kill a deal just from the start by this you is, exposing people to that information. This is well, what, time I mean, and I, value I, come into place. I was fortunate that I, had, I was trained by the right people because yeah. one of the things that was made clear to me is that if you don't put these things up front, mm -hmm. the buyer will likely discover them on their own before closing day. Yep. And so you could invest a lot of time working with yep. one of these green buyers and trying to yep. you know, coerce them into a deal or whatnot, but, but then they would back out and you'd have wasted all your time. Yeah. And I live in a small city, metro area, about 150,000 people. And I think that if you're, it's particularly if you're in a smaller city, the value that has to be placed on your reputation is, in, is that much higher. If you're in a, in a huge metro with millions and millions of people, you know, someone can burn someone and there's Fire other everywhere. people to do business with, yeah, right? Right. But in, in a smaller community, you just can't. And you have to be able to live with yourself. The, the whole thing that you're getting at, though, with, with business brokers, I find this in a lot of businesses that are project and commission driven. Yeah. Back in my Yellow Page days, one of the older guys said to me, um, he said, money doesn't really motivate a lot of people, but the lack of money will motivate people to do things they never thought they would do. And I've seen this many times in my life where you know, the big management puts on a big push and they try to offer these bonuses. And some people that are already comfortable are like, me, I already have enough money. I don't need to chase that bonus. But somebody who needs money to make their lease payment on their car, you know, when I was in Yellow Pages, the way it worked is if we wrote up a contract and submitted it, we would be paid on the next paycheck based on our commission on that contract. And we could revise that contract up until the deadline. So I actually saw some of my colleagues put in fraudulent contracts mm -hmm. just so that they would get money on their paycheck, knowing that they had time to go redo it with the customer before the deadline. So they'd be writing themselves a loan from the company and it completely unethical and fraudulent, right? But it was because they needed the money because they'd leveraged themselves up so badly with like home mortgages and car loans and all that kind of stuff. And when I saw people doing that, I was like, oh my God, like, how can you live with yourself? But that's what people do. They oh, pin yes. themselves into a corner. Oh, yes. And then the last thing they have to sell, I guess, is their own, you know, morality. So David, this is, this is really, really, really interesting. So I want to kind of connect a couple pieces here. So, you know, the normal course of business, a lot of times when you purchase a business is that you find the business. If you find the business yourself, you request the financials. Mm -hmm. You obviously can do this process by yourself or with your accountant. This is somebody who's going to have a little bit of a skewed view because an accountant is not a, a business, person. business person. You obviously, another way could be is that you use a business broker. A business broker is just like people. There's all different types of them. They, they can help you in all different ways. They can steer you towards what they want or what you want or what is the right thing to do. And there's a lot of different directions you can go. And I think you really have opened up to now talk about what you currently do mm. is that you really are almost a third door that you can have a business broker, you can have an accountant, and you also can have a business consultant to give you a third party opinion 
that really can shed light and ask questions that you might not have thought of. Unbiased. Yourself. Unbiased. Unbiased. Because a business broker is going to have a biased opinion. Your accountant is going to have a biased, more pessimistic opinion just because they're numbers driven and they're not really very usually risk takers. But you, you know, you've had a lot of different experience that is unique to yourself. And, you know, getting a, a third party opinion isn't typically best to get from a friend from their experiences because they've purchased a business. Someone else who purchased another business in another field doesn't make them an expert on yeah, your that's, business. That's biased also. Exactly. So I'd like for you to go into, if you would, into exactly what you offer your, uh, the people that you help actually and how your process works. Sure. So I did the banker thing just to complete the story. I did the banker thing for a few years. They wanted to reorganize. And by that point, people that you're describing who are trying to do a deal, they were finding my name. They were being handed my name as a referral. And I, I started to do some of the, this work on the side as, as a little bit of consulting. And when the bank created the opportunity for me to go out on my own, I decided I'm going to do this full time. I'm going to offer the expertise and services that I developed as a business broker, but I'm going to do it using the business model of the attorneys and accountants. So I'm going to just offer these services. People will pay me for what I do. And I will have no interest in the ultimate outcome of the deal. And so for every client that I work with, I'm just working with them in the moment on the thing that they're working on. And it doesn't matter to me if they ultimately buy or sell the business financially, right? And so I get approached all the time by people who want to buy a business. They'll find me online and they'll want some help. And then I position myself kind of like insurance. If you're going to go invest half a million, million dollars, $2 million into buying a business, it often would make sense to spend a couple grand with someone who's done this so many times. And so I can help analyze the deal. I can look for things that are red flags. I was talking with a guy just the other day, uh, a case, he, he has a set of financials and the profit margins indicated on the financials are way above the industry benchmarks that I had found. And so I said, you know, this is great that the guy has such a profitable business, but I find it difficult to understand how he can have margins that are so much higher than other people in the industry. It means either there's some kind of cost that is not in line, that he somehow is taking advantage of some kind of special opportunity, or these numbers are wrong. And to your point about the accountants, I find quite often people will look at financial statements and they don't ever realize that what they're looking on is ink on paper. You know, these things are created by people and oftentimes they're created from information that was put together by people who are not experts. Many small businesses don't have properly trained bookkeepers on staff. They, you know, sometimes it's the business owner or yep. the business owner's spouse maybe is trying to use QuickBooks and errors creep in and they compound over time. And I remember once I was looking at a business with a woman who wanted to sell and um, she was talking about all of her debts. And I just said, well, what's the problem with the debt? Your balance sheet says you've got uh, $300,000 in your savings account. And she said, I don't have any money in the savings account. So like her financials had not been reconciled right. for years. This is such basic. You're not giving oh. basic information, but if people don't realize this is the basic stuff you need to even understand because you're 100% right. They either misclassify something and put it in a mm -hmm. different classification on a different line item on purpose or on accident. You're 100% right. We've seen it a hundred times. Yeah. And so if you find a business, for example, with a business broker, business brokers often have a disclosure statement in everything they give you saying that they have not gone and verified things, right? They, they, they don't want to be liable for right. these errors of information. Right. And so you know, common things like double counting. So for example, in a, somebody might um, have a business and if it's an LLC, for example, in the States, somebody has got a profit at the bottom and the owner is taking that profit money. And so then when the business broker is talking with them, they say, well, I also take a paycheck every two weeks. Right. And so then the broker tries to add it back saying part of the wage expense is actually the owner's salary but they don't actually go and verify. The owner is taking money every two weeks, but his accountant is reconciling that as an owner's draw at the end of the year. It's just part of the net income. So in that instance, what'll happen is that draw money every two weeks will be double counted. It'll be represented in the net income and then added back again. And this is one of the ways that you end up with an inflated 
right. net income or inflated level of profitability. Which of and course, if, when if you're you, purchasing a business, it's usually an equation of the net income that the business has. Yeah, it's every always a doll, function of cash flow. Every dollar that, you, that they equate to be quote net income is more money that you're hypothetically going to be spending. So if you hire somebody like David and you have a consultant who's really trained to look for these different things, if he finds something that really is an on, it can be an honest mistake, right? Because some people mm -hmm. just don't know, they would be willing to renegotiate themselves because now they are being educated by a professional who is saying, hey, are you sure that your salary that you're taking, I understand it's a salary, but did you know that your accountant is doing it this way or whatever? And they, oh, I didn't realize that. So my profit margin is this. So while I think that maybe your new purchase price should be only be reconsidered at a different amount because of that. Hmm. Well, business brokers also just to get a listing and like promise all different kinds of things. Also, we've seen that as well. You know, that it seems like just to get a listing and then it ends up being not what the seller actually thought they'd be selling it for eventually when it goes through due diligence and it gets all whittled down to something else. And then that becomes, I guess a lot of these business brokers think, well, at that point, I'm in it so deep with them already. They're in it so deep with me already that I'll just figure it out at that point, but they just want the listing. The challenge that a lot of brokers face is that, yeah, they got to get the listing. Um, many of them are motivated by the fact that they need to get an income, yeah. right? So they've got to get a cash flow going. The, in a competitive market, what you'll often find is a lot of business brokers will start to lean on this idea, I can help you sell your business for more. And what it does is it creates what I call an anti-empathetic halo over the sellers. Because the business broker is saying, I can sell your business for more. I can get someone to pay a higher price. The business owner starts to think about themselves and the money and how they're going to spend the money. Mm -hmm. But in the everyday life of the business owner, what they're doing is like, think about you guys. In your everyday life, who do you think about is the customer? Can we actually increase this price? Can we offer this service? What are the customers going to think about it? Because you know that for you to make a sale of a product or service, the customer has to agree that there's value there for them. Right. So that encourages in the normal course of business, a high degree of empathy between businesses and their customers. Mm -hmm. When you put up a business for sale, your business becomes a piece of inventory on the shelf of the business broker's shop. If you want to think about that in your head, the business broker should be thinking about the buyer. How is the buyer going to afford this? What kind of person is this going to be? What's their down payment going to be? If the asking price is this amount and we, they have, I expect that they're going to have a certain down payment and they get financing, how are they going to make that financing payment? And so when people, when brokers detach from that, when they no longer think about their buyer, they're basically gassing up the sellers that they're going to get this high price. The seller starts to think about the million dollars they're going to get in the house in right. Florida and the new boat and all That's that right. kind of stuff. Right. Now, all of a sudden, we have an overpriced business on the market and a buyer comes along and there's no way that the business can be purchased because right. the price is so high. If you apply the financing and then you try to have the cash flow cover the financing cost, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And the seller at no point ever sat down and looked at it from the point of view of the buyer. When I was a business broker, I, I kept reminding myself, you don't make money by getting listings. You make money by selling businesses. And so if I couldn't get a seller to agree to a realistic price and understand what the likely terms would be, which means most small businesses don't sell for cash terms. In the States, things get askew because of the SBA. You've got the government interfering in the normal market, yeah. applying much higher leverage Certain than you qualifications, see. yeah. Well, the SBA will allow much higher leverage on business purchases right. than any other place in the world, right. right? And so most of the time you buy a small business, there's some degree of seller financing because the financing just isn't there for the buyers. Right. You have to set the seller's expectation. This is what the business is likely going to sell for. And these are what the terms are likely going to be. And because you're not going to get all the money on closing, we have to make sure we pick the right buyer right. who's going to be successful. And this is part of the assurance package for the buyer. Because if the seller doesn't see that the buyer can be successful, they're not going to sell the business because they won't collect all the payments. And that sure. actually saves the buyer from getting into a bad arrangement. Right. Right. So it's part of a risk mitigation that is a balance between the two parties. And I always taught sellers that if you're willing to finance a good chunk of the deal, not 
like 30, 40% of the deal and you pick the right buyer by mitigating the risk on the buyer's part, you're actually going to get the fairer price. This is actually the path to getting a higher price for your business by showing the buyer that I believe in you. I'm going to invest in you and your new venture by leaving part of the money on the table. And because I have this interest in your success, I'm going to be around to coach you and answer your phone calls. And even after you have picked up the ball and you're running two years from now, if you get a call from some state agency and you're not sure how to deal with it, call me. I'll tell you the, about the time I dealt with them. Right. The and so that seller wants to see success. The problem is, is that it's, it's hitting me so right square between the eyes because as the world is becoming more and more apathetic and not empathetic, and when people hear that, they say, well, why should I be empathetic towards someone that I'm selling my business to? That's exactly the problem with the world if that's what went through your brain. You know, someone listening, because you do have to, otherwise you won't end up in an arrangement that's a win-win situation. Yeah. You only are one-sided. Everyone is full of apathy now. No one cares what the results are for the person that's buying it. Take it off my hands. You're buying it, your problem. And we have experienced that with our businesses too. It's not their problem. They don't want anything to do with it. They're not, like you just mentioned, you're not calling them a year from now. They've made it very clear. Not don't call me. Don't fucking call me. It's not my fucking problem. And that's the apathy that is in the world and the mindset right now. And it's a shame because I think what happens is people also that are selling businesses don't understand if you just put forth a drop more effort or a drop of empathy with people that are taking over the business that you had, you probably, if his money is what matters to you, you will get more money. Mm -hmm. Because if you promise someone and give them the hopes that you will actually be there to do that, they will probably pay you more money. Listen, I've seen some pretty interesting arrangements. I've, I've seen buyers and sellers come together where a business has a lack of profitability, right? Yeah. There's a, one client I have right now where he's actually going to start working with the seller as a consultant and the seller yeah. is going to pay him. And as the business improves, it's got a lot of issues with systems and margin and things like this. And the buyer is an expert in this field. He can help them. So as the business improves, the business will become more profitable and become more valuable. And the buyer knows that they will have to pay a higher price for the business once this year of transition and, and consulting has, has taken place. Nice to hear. The idea is that the consulting fees he receives are going to turn around and become part of his down payment. Got it. And the seller says, well, like, why are you wanting to help me improve if it means you're going to have to pay more for the business? And the buyer's response is, I am de-risking the transaction for myself. If it's I can all about cash flow. Business. It's all about yeah. the money that the business is spending off to pay for the debt and then how much you make with the money. It's not really about what you pay. It's about what you make also too. So, yeah. you know, the listen, buying a business is risky, especially because you're really only getting a half measure of the information. That's why it's really so important right. that you, somebody like you is around to help educate, train, prepare, coach, analyze, and give them real guidance yeah. to determine what is the best course of action. Listen, a creative way of, of what you just said actually is something I've never heard actually. So me listening to this now gives me another tool in my tool belt to realize that is actually another angle. I actually might want to buy a certain business that I know in my industry, but why would I buy them? They make no money. What is the point? You know what I mean? So why not figure out something that's mutually beneficial for both of you that the person can improve their business, they can sell it for more, you can make a little bit of money while you're doing it also and consult with them or whatever. Worst case scenario, guess what? You made a little bit of money from it, you mm -hmm. gave a little bit of your time, but guess what? You didn't risk all that money and time and you're stuck with a business that you don't want to own, don't need to own, doesn't make any sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the reason why you want to buy a business instead of starting one is because you don't want to go through that money losing startup period. You want to buy a business that has that cash flow immediately from the time you buy it. Yeah. But if you don't buy it in the correct fashion, then you end up absorbing or taking on a lot of the risks that startup space anyway. And the biggest risk is over committing cash flow to debt service. And like, I point the finger a lot of the times at bankers for this because they allow debt service coverage ratios that are far too low, in my opinion. 
I've seen business financials going back for years and I've seen oscillations in revenue of like 10% a year. And when you see that consistently, you're like, well, a 10% oscillation is really just flat, right? It's just a business that's kind of doing the same thing. It's just bumping up and down all the time. But depending on your direct costs versus your overhead costs, in some businesses, a 10% decline in revenue could be a 50% decline in profit. But they know better, these bankers. And again, that's apathy, not empathy also. Because even though, yes, it's all business, you're still saying that they have to display some sort of empathetic way so that they understand that this business person is going to be able to live up to whatever commitments they're signing up for. Yeah, but think about the bankers. Because here's the question is, what is the interest of the banker? At one time, or if you're dealing with a bank that holds all its own notes, mm -hmm. they do not want to deal with a foreclosure, right? So, so that banker is going to be watching out for themselves, and in, in, by extension, they work out for the well, they look out for the buyer. Yeah. yeah. But if that bank is originating and selling those notes, oh, they don't care, right? And if there's a government guarantee on it, yeah, they the, get their well, money. This is the slippery right. slope, right? Right. And so then it becomes about becoming a paper mill. That's exactly my point though, is yeah. that no one cares. It's your problem. You're stuck with it. You signed up for it. And just like John said, you only get a piece of the information during the due diligence, everything. Into, they all know what's going to happen. They all know what's possible. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. There's no safeguards for the business buyer. There's nothing that, and it's not the mean that the business buyer needs to be getting handouts and favors. It's just so that it's fair. And you know, the old saying once and for all, Life isn't fair. <laughs> and it <laughs> and, translates into this. And so for buyers, the way around it is to make sure you have a deal structure. That's right. Like I mentioned with proper seller note and stuff. And the only leverage a buyer has in this negotiation is a willingness to not do the deal. And I've got, I run a coaching group for people that are buying businesses and I've seen people make their best offer that works for them. The seller wants more down. They want a bigger price, whatever. And they, and with a lot of hesitation and uncertainty, the buyer will draw back because they're always afraid they're not going to find a good deal like this again or a good business like this. And then they stop talking with them and the seller goes and talks with other people perhaps. And then a couple months later, they're talking again. And I always say to people, if you find a problem with a business that, that makes you hesitant or makes you feel it's worth less, there are these buyers out there who are uninformed buyers who might come in and do the deal the way the seller wants, but in all likelihood, other buyers are going to find the same problems. Yeah. And so you just have to stick to your guns and only do a deal that works for you. Yeah. Because your aggravation of not doing a deal is much worse than doing the wrong deal. It has really been great having you on the Cultivating Success podcast. This has been really, really, really informational for me personally. And I think that, you know, there's a lot more really to unpack here. We'll definitely need to, I think, speak about this some more because I think your particular angle of, you know, I'd like to get into more of your preparation and coaching and education in this, I think really can be like helpful to the people that are listening. So I'd like for them to be able to connect with you. If you could please let them know where can they actually find you to get more information from you and possibly use you as a resource. Sure. The place to go is my blog site. It's davidcbarnett.com. And from there, you find links to all the different stuff that I have online. And, and the biggest resource is my YouTube channel. There's about 500 videos on there. I've been posting since 2014. Wow. All about buying, selling, financing, and managing small, medium-sized businesses. And there's an email that lists there as well. So if somebody wants to get an email from me, I usually email every day where I talk about a deal or an experience or uh, an idea. Uh, and then once a week, I send out a reminder that the new video is live. So people who are interested in deals and business, um, sign up for the email list. You'll love it. This is something where people, you know, a lot of times might, you know, gravitate towards these larger influencers. You are giving real solid, solid business advice here. And this is not theory. It's not perspective. It's real business advice. You know what else it is? Basics, the basics. And you have to always go back to the basics. So definitely recommend everyone to please check out David's uh, YouTube channel. Wow, 500 videos, amazing. David, great having you here today. Look forward to talking soon. Thank you so much. Listen, guys, it was great to meet you. Thanks for having me on and uh, look forward to next time. For Thanks, sure. David. This has been the Cultivating Success Podcast with Jeff Sofer and Jonathan Wolfson. 
To learn more about Jeff and Jonathan and their businesses, visit www.naturesexperts.com.